This show is presented by the 323 Network. You can watch all your favorite 323 friends and shows on the 323 Network YouTube channel. Follow us on all social media platforms at 323read. And support us as we continue to grow at patreon.com slash 323read. That's 323-R-E-I-D. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 323. I am your host, Reed Murphy. It is good to be back. Feel refreshed here with the one and only host of the 323 College Shame Day, Scott Elliott. And we're just feeling good. We're feeling refreshed. It's a beautiful day here in Virginia. Probably, I guess, the most beautiful day of the year by far. We've been off for a couple weeks because the Super Bowl and the NFL season and college football season just completely eliminated us. It's completely wiped us out. (laughs) But we're back. There's a lot happening in sports, including NFL offseason. There's a lot of NFL offseason talk to get to, but we're going to get to everything. We're going to get to basketball. We've got some logo talk. But a lot of this prep that we've been doing, folks, is for... What is it called, Scott? I imagine you're referring to Awesome Con. He got it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Awesome Con 2024. We are going to be back doing the unfamily friendly, geeky family feud panel. This time bigger than ever. Bigger, badder, late night show following the guys from Smallville, Tom Welling and Michael Rosenbaum. It's going to be awesome. That is Friday, March 8th, despite what Zoo says in our promo of repeatedly saying March 9th. It is March 8th, March 8th at 9 p.m. in room 207A at the Walter E. Washington Convention Center in D.C. It's going to be a really awesome time. Uh, There's going to be a lot of cool things to do. I've been prepping it. We've got a big thing coming up that you'll see some stuff later if you subscribe and are already watching on the 323 Network YouTube page. There's something big coming later this month. You need to be ready for it. We'll have a promo for it a little later, but it's going to be a fun time. I'm excited for it. I don't know how you're feeling, Scott. Are you nervous, excited? No, I have had, ever since you had let us all know months ago that we'd be doing this uh, in March, I've had it pinned on my calendar um, when I redid my whiteboard for the month of March the other day, that was the first thing I wrote down. I have been so pumped and so amped to not only get out with with you and Zoo and uh, a few other individuals that will be there again this year, but but the fans. You know, We had a really great reception with the people who came out last year, um, some really great interaction with you know just people in general at the con. So I'm actually really excited to get back out. Do you have a blackboard in February if you have a whiteboard in March? No, but I used predominantly a black marker if that helps. Okay, that's good. All right, just checking. Keeping you checked. We got to make sure. And I did get and I and I did make sure to write down 29 days this year, not 28 days. You get that, your extra day. I feel like that has to destroy some people sometimes that they are not <laughs> prepared for that 29th day and then it hits and I don't know if it could be good or bad. Maybe you're thinking that you owe a payday or something. And you get a bonus a day for it to do whatever it is that you do to get extra money. I don't know. No, but it was funny. Um, I guess quick leap day talk, uh, which I didn't think was on the docket today. But um, there was a huge uproar about how, you know, if you're a salaried employee and if leap day falls down on a week, if leap day falls on a weekday in that year, you're technically working for free. That's true. I guess. Yeah, nobody thought about that before, huh? Nope. I guess Mm. there's no leap day bonus. Damn. And hey, I mean, happy late birthday to all the leap babies. Like Tyrese Halliburton, great NBA player, great NBA star. He is only six years old, and he's doing all of this (laughs) at six. Congratulations to him. Happy birthday to all of them. Look, it's there's a lot of great basketball stuff happening. We're going to do a pretty quickish show before we get into awesome con and all the prep and content that's going to come out of that. And really the foray of March and March madness. We'll hopefully be talking to the two uh, old ladies, almost said two broke girls, the two old ladies, the bet (laughs) 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 about March madness. But 
Scott, we're only a few days into March, and there's already madness. The tournament hasn't even started, and we're getting madness in a variety of ways with college basketball. One of the biggest ones coming from Western Michigan. Western Michigan basketball over the past weekend with this insane ending to their last game. That Western Michigan has had dialed up. It's a football route at this point. 1.6 on the clock. The heave. Oh my goodness! The oh tap my. Win. That's insane. Are you kidding me? Wow. <laughs> Ice is it. A wow. Full, a full court bounce pass to win the game. <laughs> well, it's like, how is he not marked? Like, where was his man? I mean, if you replay that, you can see the guy who was right there next to the basket just completely walks away from him and just that Western Michigan doesn't eat with no regard. It's a football route at this point. One I mean, that's, a, that's exactly clock. right. Yeah. Yep. Look, oh yeah. Goodness, Nothing. Are you kidding me? Any that school- is some safety play that Ed Reed would love to see on the basketball court. He just sat back there on the line, just waited for it to get back to him, and he took it. He took advantage of that shot. <laughs> that's a hundred percent true. That's that's a and that that would be a court stormer. There's been a lot of talk about a storm in the court this past week. Mm-hmm. That would be a court stormer if it hadn't been for fucking Duke. It's always Duke. Why does it have to be Duke? Do a Duke player getting alleged allegedly hurt? during one of the court storming operations. How do you feel about court storming or field storming in general? I'm I'm for it under certain conditions. Like if if you're storming the court, you're storming the field for like you you beat a team that you should have already beat. Like if, if it was like but if it was like some massive like rivalry game with like huge historic implications or if it's some like crazy cinderella story that happened like i'm for it at that point like your 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 fan base should be allowed to you know celebrate with the team in that kind of a of a regard but i think in the in in a general sense it just in the nature of the world today i mean we I, we touched up on it you know a couple weeks ago about what happened what transpired at the kansas city thing um parade for their super bowl win i think there's just a uh uh, hyper focus on not only player safety, but fan safety. It's what's going to happen is you're going to have a, a malice at the palace part two, and there's going to be some all out brawl on the court. And that's going to completely nix any sort of from that on out. But I think if they're able to do it in a safe manner, go for it. I think the only, I think this past time in the incident that happened between Dake Duke and uh, wake forest, you can't do, I get that it's Duke. But Wake Forest was a two point favorite in that game. You can't storm right. the court. You can't storm the right. court if you were a favorite. <laughs> right. And like really the only tie to that is just, you know, how connected those two institutions have been. You know, Wake Forest is only what, maybe I mean, maybe forty five minutes, an hour away from Raleigh and Durham. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's more of a geographical kind of thing. But yeah, you come into the game as a favorite and you win. Cool. Right. You, that you handle the business like you should have been like you should have been there. Exactly. Exactly. Well, look, somebody who handles business, especially in college basketball, she'll be handling her business in the pros soon enough. Caitlin Clark, Iowa superstar. She is officially headed to the WNBA. She's going pro, uh, made her goodbye letter the other day, and she she made a huge mark this past Sunday. She passed Pistol Pete Maravich. I love calling him Pistol Pete. Makes me feel like Chris Mad Dog Russo. She passed Pistol Pete Maravich as the all-time leading scorer in NCAA basketball history. Not women's history. Men's history, too. She is the all-time leading scorer in college basketball history. How great is she going to be for the WNBA, Scott? And, I mean, possibly even the NBA, if you're talking about what, you know, I mean, we just saw the NBA All-Star game. They had Sabrina Ionesco come in and uh, compete in the three-point contests, it's 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 looking a little lucrative when you have somebody like Caitlin Clark come in and maybe do some NBA stuff. Yeah, I actually, now that I, I never thought about it until this very second, but I think with how many issues that the NBA All-Star game had, out, not, not like the skills competitions and like kind of the celebrity games and the three-point 
but there is a big issue with the dunk contest now and the all-star game itself. I think it would actually be a really cool thing for the WNBA and the NBA to do, to do an integrated all-star game and actually have the teams mixed with men and women for both sides. I think that would be actually a really cool thing to kind of help promote and get a platform for the WNBA as a whole. But for her, um, you're always looking for that one breakout star, that one big name who's going to come out and, you know, put a team on the map or put, you know, a league on the map. And I think she has gathered such a huge following, not just with women, but also with men who really love basketball. I think she's going to do really good things for the WNBA. I think she's going to be an incredible pro. I don't go out of my way to watch college basketball at all. Men's basketball, no. women's basketball. I could, I could not care any time before March. I have gone out of my way several times to watch Iowa women's basketball games to see Caitlin Clark play. I will absolutely be doing the same thing wherever she lands in the WNBA. I mean, you see the lines and the ticket sales for Iowa basketball right now because of her. It's going to be insane. And I think I think the NBA trying to integrate a little more of the WNBA stars now over this past year, especially over the past year and past two years, has been to prepare for somebody like Caitlin Clark, Angel Reese, Paige Beckers before them when she was like the biggest star of them. You you want to start getting that integration now so it doesn't look like you're just doing it for Caitlin Clark to get Clayton right. Clark in these games and stuff. But she will be a massive draw. She's going to be a big time. And I think that's that would actually be an awesome save for the All-Star game, like you said, to actually integrate the players and have like mixed teams or something for it because, I mean, it was it was shit. I didn't watch any of it. I watched a little bit of Saturday night, uh, the Saturday night skills tournament, and mm -hmm. mostly for the Steph Sabrina battle. But if it's just yeah, and I don't know if you could start doing like three on three games where you're mixing in some of the WNBA All Stars into those teams, or doing like King of the Court or something like that. But she is going to be a huge profit maker for the WNBA and basketball as a whole. There are a lot of young girls who are watching her now who want to be like her. A lot of my young kids and young girls are playing basketball heavier and harder during daycare because their parents mm -hmm. are watching Caitlin Clark games and they want to be like her. She's going to be huge for the sport. I'm very excited for her to get into the pros and to see what she does to the WNBA. If only, if only the Mystics could be so bad. If only. <laughs> <laughs> Now, somebody currently in the pros has been in the pros for 21 years now. LeBron James, first player in NBA history to score 40,000 points. Where does he rank all time for you, Scott? Top three? He has to be. I don't have him. I mean, he has to be top three, at least. Um, I, I still don't give him one. Two's kind of a stretch, but I think for me, his ceiling's three. Yeah. I could, I, the thing with LeBron is just like, he's unstoppable. He in prime LeBron, peak LeBron, unstoppable in unstoppable size, something that you're not ever going to see with that speed. But for him to be at his current age, he, if, if he's not 40, he's damn near 40 uh, uh, at 39, something around there for him to be playing at the level that he's still playing. His defense is shot. He's not defense. He's not playing at a defensive player of the year level anymore. He doesn't need to. You can attack him freely, but he can still just hold up an offense. For and, and there's no reason that he should be at this age. And he's still like the powerhouse of that team. Even when you have somebody, somebody like Anthony Davis and Austin Reeves and whatever on that team, LeBron is the one that you're looking to. I mean, they're talking about him possibly getting a, a two-year, nine-figure extension to stay with the Lakers, which I think... If he's going to stay with the Lakers, psst, that's a sign that Bronny's going to stay at USC. Stop putting him in mock drafts and making LeBron mad, even though he's the one that started the whole talk. Don't get me started on that guy. <laughs> <laughs> no, and because and, and, one thing that LeBron has always done, whether or not he came out, like right when he came out of high school all the way to now at 39 years old, is when he's on the court, you have to account for him, yes. regardless of his age. And you're going to have a lot of these – people who are going to you know speak ill against him as a as a player 
off court stuff aside, his Twitter account uh, to the side, him as a player itself, uh, like that 40,000 point number is amazing. Congrats, LeBron. That's awesome. You know, ever since I've really watched the NBA, he's always been a part of it. You know, going back, what you said, 20, 21 years now. Yeah, 21 years. I mean, I can remember when he, I can remember that. I can remember that the draft night when he got drafted, it was him and Carmelo and all of them and Chris Bosch and all of them. But you're going to have all these people saying, oh, it's only because he played 20 plus years. Okay, isn't that a feat with a physical feat within itself? Like, what players? It's it's a, a Tom Brady effect, right? You know, it's just like you're playing for so long, you get people just get so accustomed to seeing there on the court. It's just, it, it it has to be something that should be celebrated. But yeah, the 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 brawny talk needs to stop. I, what you're saying is like, I mean, what you're saying is 100 percent true that it's something that needs to be celebrated. But that's, I mean, that's how sports fandom works. We never appreciate greatness until it's, you know, not on the court or on the field anymore. I mean, that's what happened with Brady. Like, I really, as much as I couldn't stand Tom Brady throughout my entire childhood, being raised on football and raised on Tom Brady, I missed him this past year. It was weird not seeing Brady in games. It creates a vacuum. You know, it, does. it creates a, a hole in the whole just league itself. Like you said, I mean, you have this is the first year without Tom Brady, and you're like, now what do we do? Right. And the NBA will move on after LeBron. I mean, I'm sure people had the same thought process with Michael Jordan when he was getting towards the end. Somebody will come along, maybe not on that level, but some greatness will appear after him. But his greatness should be celebrated. What we're watching is unheard of. What we're seeing is unheard of. I will forever think about, I believe, I think he was with the Cavs when he did this like full across the court speed to deflect a layup against whoever they were playing in the finals. And it was just one of the most insane clutch moments I've seen. And I was like, this is fucking LeBron. Like, this is the King that they're always talking about. This is what you, this is what you want. And I'm, I'm excited to celebrate him. I hope, I hope whenever he does retire, he does the, you know, the whole retirement tour like Kobe Bryant did. Uh, not like Tim Duncan, who Tim Duncan just retired and said, is they were like, are you coming back next year? He's like, no. <laughs> and they're like, wait. <laughs> I want the whole tour. I want the whole celebration to happen. Well, and it's funny that you bring that up because he was asked about if he would want that whole farewell tour. And he said something offhand that like, that's not what it's about. I'm like, bullshit. bullshit. You, you want the spotlight. You've wanted the spotlight for the last 20 years. There is no way on this earth that you would announce your retirement a year ahead of time so you can have your whole farewell tour. It's, uh, it, it's not going to happen. Not a chance. Not a chance. Well, let's move on to another veteran athlete, a veteran star athlete this time in the NFL. And we're, we're going to talk a little bit about Russell Wilson. I want to talk about Russell Wilson. Dangerous. Uh, you know, let, let him cook. Broncos country. Let's ride. That guy. We're going to talk about he's not with Bron he won't be with Broncos country for much longer and that's what I want to talk about here is he's entering his villain era. I think even with his look, he's starting to get the full the full villain era aspect. He was on Brandon Marshall's I am athlete recently and he said a couple things first about his future and then we'll get into talk about his benching and where he goes from here. But this is Russell Wilson on I am athlete talking to Brandon Marshall about what's next. So you sitting here at 35 so you feel the best you've ever felt. Do you still have that obsession? I got more fire than ever, honestly, especially over the past two years of what I've gone through, whether it's in Denver or somewhere else. I, I hope it's in Denver. You know, I hope I get to finish there. I, I committed there. I wanted to be there. You know, I want to be there. For me, it's about winning. Over the next five years, I want to win too. I want to feel the chill of that trophy again. You know, I, I love the city and everything else. But, you know, you also want to be a place that, that wants you, too. So the thing that I, I, I want to do is, is, is win, man. That's all, that's all I care about. I love the way that uh, Brandon Marshall is looking at him there towards the end of just this kind of judgment. It's, it's that look that you get from your friend when they're talking about something and talking about something very passionate. And you just look at him and you're like, you sure about that? It's sure it's like when uh, it's like when one of your friends say that they're going to go into nursing and you just like look at them or they going to be a, they want to be a psychiatrist and you're just like, are you sure that's what you want to do? You sure about that? <laughs> you sure about that? No, is... but the, the the look that Russ gives him, it's it's clear that he has slowly embraced hit the the villain side of and, everything. And I mean, where that's rooted from, I can kind of understand 
being a little pissed, not a little, a lot of pissed at Sean Payton and the Broncos. And I will always commend Russell Wilson for how he handled the benching, but we'll let him tell exactly how, you know, what went into that whole situation and how kind of fucked up it was. And so we beat Green Bay, Kansas City. We beat them. And uh, as you mentioned, that's when, as you mentioned earlier, that's when I got that call. And I was like, I'm confused what's going on. And I didn't believe it at first. I was like, this, this can't be real. And I got that call that, hey, we're going to bench you for the next nine games if you, know, you don't change your injury guarantee. So for me. But to be clear here, they, it's, it's not, they don't want to bench you because of play. They're saying they're benching you because they want you to take out the injury guarantee. Yeah, they want they yeah they want to re- push back my injury guarantee and remove it for that the rest of the year. So that way, if I get injured, that they don't have to pay it. But that's why, as a player, it doesn't even make sense to do that because you think of those Alex Smith moments, and then hell, you can even go back to college, like Willis McGahey, I believe it was, uh, at the U. One of his last games going into NFL, he tears everything in, or maybe it's Frank Gore, everything in their knee. I didn't want to set a, a precedent for players to remove their injury guarantees, too, as well. And so it, it, it was it was no way I was going to do that. And so when they said, hey, we're, we're going to bench you, we're going to bench you, I said, all right, that, that's what you want to do. Bro, that's like extortion. Yeah. Uh, how, like, you got the NFL PA involved, attorneys involved, like, obviously. Well, like- I, I didn't want to, but then, then they kept saying it all the way throughout the week. So then, you know. You know my agent talked to the NFLPA. The NFLPA called me. They asked, you know, and then they they talked to the NFL. The NFL was like, "This can't, we can't. This is illegal. You can't do this." And so then, you know, all the way throughout Saturday. So I was just like sitting here. I didn't know if I was going to play the following week. We had Monday Night Football against the Buffalo Bills the following week. So I'm like, "Am I going to play? Am I not?" Like, so 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 like, so you got Russell Wilson in his camp, and then you got the Denver Broncos. Everybody looking at each other. Who's going to make the first move? You going to sign? You going to take? It? I, I wasn't going to do it. He I wasn't going to blink. No shot. I ain't, doing that. I ain't taking my injury guarantee. But. So now I'm sitting there like, okay, well, we'll see what happens. So then the whole week, all the way, and I get back on Monday. I still don't know necessarily what's going to happen. And uh, on, that, on that Monday, that's when I meet with Sean. And Sean's like, hey, don't forget like nothing happened. We're just, you're going to play this week against Buffalo. we got a big game against Buffalo. you got to go win on Monday Night Football. And I'm like, all right. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's pretty fucked up. It's pretty it's pretty insane the what happened there. And I remember I remember just during the season, like it just seemed like Sean Baden hated him. The way that he would scream at him during uh I mean just the slightest mess ups, even though this was a improved season by Russell Wilson. He he looked a lot better. He played more of the game manager type that he should have been playing. Is you know, the skill set is arm has gone down a little bit. The mobility has gone down a little bit, but that comes with age. He started playing the way that you need him to play. I don't know what Peyton really wanted from him, except for the fact that he didn't want him and he wanted to try and kind of run him out of the place. But Russell is a business guy, a very, very strong minded business guy. He wasn't going to play that game. He was going to get his money. Now you have the report that once he's released, he will happily Signed the veteran minimum, which is like one, I think 1.4 minimum million for quarterbacks, something like mm. that. It's some, it's, it's very low. I think it's, it's probably honestly lower than 1.4 million, but he will sign for the veteran minimum with which, with whatever team that wants to sign him to be a starter and just continue to get paid the, I think 38 million that Denver is going to owe him this season for cutting him. They will still have to pay that off so he can go to whatever team. So, Scott, I'll ask you, do you are you are you embracing Russell Wilson's villain era too? The return of Mr. Un- Mr. Unlimited. Mr. <laughs> Unlimited is back. And what team what team should take a shot on him? Anyway. Uh I am actually I so I've never been one who's been like a huge fan of Russell Wilson. There's always been something kind of rubbing me the wrong way, even when it's time in college, both at NC State and at Wisconsin. But you know, I it there's something commendable in in the way he kind of handled the situation. It was clear that Denver wanted to move on from him. They're like Brandon Marshall said, there's almost kind of extortion at the end of the day. Like, well, we're not gonna we're not gonna keep playing you unless you waive, you know, your injury. You know, clause it's no i'm going to protect myself because god forbid i i sign off on that and i go out there i have some gruesome you know career ending injury or something along those lines and then right. i'm just up up the creek without a paddle so he, he he definitely that's when 
you know, I constantly say, you know, when, when you, when a player can get that bag or they can get that paycheck, go after the money. Cause your careers are super short, especially at that level and uh, that position as well as a quarterback. So don't let that safety net go. Um, as far as teams that I feel that should make a stretch for them, um, I actually have three for you, Reed, and I want to get your thoughts on these. The third one, I'm going to roll the third one out because this is probably the least likely thing to happen, but it would be very funny if it were to happen. The Seattle Seahawks. I, Pete Carroll's I, gone. I've thought about that one. <laughs> I've actually I've thought about that one. <laughs> I'm just very interested to know what the dynamic is between him and the GM. I believe is Jeff Schneider. Some he's yeah, been John, there forever. John, yeah, John Schneider. Yeah, I, I would be I'd be interested to know what their what their relationship is going to be, um, because they're definitely a quarterback needy team at this stage. But going back to what he said, you know, he wants to play for another five years, and of those five years, he wants to win two more rings. So he has to land at a team that has the talent around him, and it really boils down to two: uh, the Minnesota Vikings. Don't have a really great team around them. Um, but I think the team that makes the most sense, looking at big picture, um, they got a great team. Uh, it seems like their culture is really on the upswing. Um, they have a really big market. Oh, and by the way, they can actually play one of his former teams twice in a year, and that's the Las Vegas Raiders. Ooh. I, I think if, I, I if, like the Raiders. Yeah, I think if the Raiders were to pick him up, because he doesn't give me the vibe of being really a big mentor to young quarterbacks. I don't know what the I don't know what it is. He just doesn't seem like he wants to be that role. He wants to be the number one guy. It's clear as day that's the case. And you have a team like the Raiders with Devontae Adams. You know, you bring back Josh Jacobs. You got Max Crosby on the other side. Antonio Pierce looks like the players are completely bought into his regime at this point in Vegas. I think if they were to land him, especially in the AFC West, where the Chargers are shitting the bed left and right, the Chiefs are kind of petering out the only thing good going for them is their their head coach which reed i don't know if you saw the uh the recent rankings that players had for, for teams that was that was very <laughs> wild to have the chiefs owner dead last and head right. coach right up there i was like okay maybe that's i guess maybe that's the uh the formula right and it's just like and then you have the broncos sitting there so like if you can go in and play the broncos twice a year and really stick it to them i think that would be really good for russ to land in to me, I think of those options, I like Minnesota the most. I think Minnesota would be the best one for him and probably for the team, for the Vikings in general. This is going to be – it's going to be really hard to trade up and get a quarterback that's going to immediately help them if they lose Cousins. And I think Atlanta, Vegas, they're a little more hungry to trade up and get a quarterback if Washington and New England, you know, if one of them trades out or both of them. So I think Minnesota kind of is like the odd team out. Russell would probably be the perfect like band-aid there that will keep Justin Jefferson happy, that will keep Jordan Addison happy. They can kind of keep an offense moving. The O-line's pretty good there. Shouldn't have really too many complaints from him for that team. So uh, yeah, I like Minnesota. I like Minnesota the most, but Vegas isn't a bad option. And like I like I was telling you before the show, if you go off of Madden for me, which Mad Madden, my Madden franchises have predicted a lot. They have Russell Wilson going to the Patriots and being a MVP candidate front runner and throwing for, you know, 45 touchdowns by like a nine and five record. So I don't, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> well, look, a quarterback veteran, he's still out in free agency, really. He hasn't actually retired. You can get him if you need him. Former Patriot quarterback here. Not Tom Brady. Cam Newton. Cam Newton was uh, making headlines the other day. I don't know if you've got anything for him. We've talked plenty about Cam in the past, but I want to analyze something before it goes out of the news waves. And that was a fight he had at a all-star, I guess, some type of fundraising little game for kids, which is the best part. This was for kids. And this is where a fight broke out. Some dudes who I don't even, I don't even care to learn where they're from or who they are, because that feels like the attention that they want here they were social media people. They jumped Cam Newton and tried to pick a fight with him. And I will ask you three, three, three questions that you can choose from here, or three answers you can choose from. What was what was more? It was more impressive the way that Cam won this fight. More impressive the way the hat never budged, or just purely stupid 
of the crew to even think, hey, I could kick Cam Newton's ass. Let's let's watch and find out. I mean the hat, the hat, the hat from that top angle just never moved. No, and, <laughs> and like it, it, the the best part of this video was Scott. I didn't. All it was was that it popped up on my feed like a week ago, and I'm looking at it, and it doesn't say. There's nothing about who's in it, who's in the fight. I'm just watching a fight video, and I see like the wicked witch hat in the distance. And I'm like, damn, is that Cam Newton with that hat? Who would wear a hat? And then I saw it was Cam. I was like, that's fucking great. It didn't budge. Yeah, I think of the three questions that you posed to me, I think the first and the third kind of work hand in hand. The man's 6'5", 240. I mean... He's scary for football players. Us. Right. It's like, I'm not surprised he held his own against 1v3. And it's complete just stupidity and uh, just just being a complete idiot thinking that you could even jump a man like that i was most impressed by the hat that's what i was most impressed of that but (laughs) and and the thing that really gets me and it really whenever you see videos of this like you know surface and you hear you know it's not even just at you know it is a youth football camp it's supposed to be something you're supposed to be there for the kids so for them to come out and and do this is completely asinine but what really uh, just really bothers me when stuff like this happens. This, these kind of circumstances are when you see progress be thwarted and, yes. you know, progressive uh, progression in the culture and in society and all things of that nature. Because I mean, you saw people tweeting uh, under this video and reposting saying, Oh, you would never see this in a Manning camp. Right. You know, it's just like, you're, you're just coming out and you're just perpetuating stereotypes and it's just, it's, it's not doing any good. So like, why, why are you even entertaining the thought of doing something like this? What are you get looking to gain? You're trying to get the hat. I think that's what it really came down to was they wanted, they wanted, they wanted this hat. I mean, look at it. If any, if anybody has seen what we do in the shadows, it looks like Laszlo Cravensworth's cursed hat. I have a question. Because after you just replayed that video, I finally caught something. Those aren't feathers off the top of his hat, right? <laughs> Are those his dreads? Are they? Oh, wait a minute. So he had... Ooh. That might be his hair coming through the hat. That's even more impressive if it stayed on. We need to do some 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 actual journalism here and investigate what this hat was. Morty on Google. Don't all right. Worry. All right. You get that going. We'll, move, <laughs> we'll keep moving to the next. Oh. <laughs> as a, as a, as an avid hat wearer myself, I can appreciate a good hat. So if we could find Cam Newton's hats and wear them for the panel, that would be whatever wonderful. brand hat that he was wearing. They need to take advantage of that as a marketing ploy. Oh my cause... God. Put that in an action movie. Like John wick wearing one of those feathered hats. Look, Cam Newton was a combine legend, NFL combine legend, somebody who put up fantastic stats. NFL combine has should be just about wound up by the time we're finishing a recording here. And every year there's lots of arguments as to whether or not we need the combine, whether most players should just do pro days, the good and the bad, the pros and the cons of combine. I have mixed feelings about the combine. To the point, I like it for an entertainment value. I like it to learn more about some of these players and see them actually doing the things because you don't see that as a fan with pro days and uh, visits. But at the same time, it also feels to me kind of like uh, almost like a modern day slave block in like an auction where you have these dudes, a lot of them black, shirtless, and you're measuring them, you're checking them up and down. You're having, hey, let's see how high that one can jump. Let's see uh, how fast that one is, how strong he is, and all this stuff. <laughs> it feels gross to me that we're just we're, we're throwing them out there. And these guys are desperate. A lot of them are desperate. They need this. They need it to up their stock and to get somewhere in the NFL. But now you have guys like Caleb Williams, and you know the USC quarterback projected to be the number one overall pick, telling teams almost on a Deion Sanders level, not all 32 teams are going to draft me. 
not all 32 teams are going to have a chance to draft me. And like, and he said it in the most respectful, non-arrogant way. But it's true. They're not all going to have a chance. Why should I be giving my tests and my medicals to all of them? I'm going to talk to the ones that I think have a shot and think want me and think are really after me. Give a fuck about Kansas City. They're never going to be anywhere close to even considering it. You have a lot of teams that are doing this. Deion Sanders, by the way, it's my favorite combine quote of the Giants, the New York Giants asking him to take some type of test. And he looked them in their faces and said, y'all don't have a shot at drafting me. And then walked away. (laughs) Did not even consider the test. Said nothing about the test. Just fuck you, I'm out. There's no point. Don't talk to me unless you drafted me. So, any thoughts on the NFL Combine this year, Scott? What is anything that you saw that was noteworthy and really cool? Uh, yeah. To play off what you just said, I did see something that was noteworthy, and that was Xavier Worthy running a four-two-one in his forty. That's crazy. That is just wild. And it's not even just him, but just like the 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 quarter the cornerback that we kind of talked about briefly when we did the the way super duper too early mock draft for the NFL. Uh, Quinion Mitchell, the cornerback out of Toledo, he ran a four three and he lit up the stage across the board. Um, I think in, if you even outside of, you know, those position groups of wide receiver and cornerback, I mean, you had some of these DNs and these edge rushers running four fours and four fives. So I think just the, the sheer athleticism that these kids are coming out of college with going into the NFL is insane. It really does show how much parity there really is in not only college football, but what's eventually going to start transitioning over to the NFL. Right. What about quarterbacks? Any interesting stuff from there? Because we saw a lot of the top quarterbacks, Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels, they didn't really want to throw. They didn't want to participate in a lot of stuff. And you can't really blame them after, you know, some issues that occurred with CJ Stroud last year with quarterbacks of the past in terms of their testing and things that kind of throw them off. Anything interesting from any of the other quarterbacks that performed? I heard Bo Nix had a pretty good combine. Yeah, Bo Nix had a really great combine. Um, J.J. McCarthy really showed out. Um, I think a lot of pundits were saying that you could see J.J. McCarthy get off on the top five in the drafts. That's, that's um, I think that's what's kind of been linked, which is wild. <laughs> um, I think, and kind of going back to what you said, I mean, two things. One, when you, you, you had four out of the 14 quarterbacks there run a 40-yard dash. That's just insane. I mean, you had you had uh, Caden Slovis from BYU, Sam Harton from Notre Dame, Austin Reed from Western Kentucky, and then Spencer Rattler from South Carolina. There was the only four quarterbacks actually ran their 40-yard dash. This brings up a whole different issue between this and some quarterbacks refusing to throw. Like you said, Caleb Williams kind of refusing to do a lot of things because he knows he's going to get off the board in the top two picks anyways. Yep. I've, I always have felt in this year, it's more pronounced than others, that if you – are being invited to arguably the biggest recruiting stage for the NFL in the NFL combine. If you're being invited in there, there needs to be some sort of clause stating that you need to participate in all of the events because that's the reason you're there. You're taking up a slot from some other kid who's, you know, more hungry than you, who doesn't have as much game film as you do on, on, on tape, who would take advantage of this opportunity in a heartbeat. So for you to go out there and not participate in all the events like you should be obligated to is just disgusting to me. You know, yes, I understand that they need to protect their bodies because who knows they could go out there 40 and completely shred their ACL. I understand the threat is there. But my thing is, if you are if you're already projected to go number one, why are you even going? Like, why are you even there? It's a good it's an excellent point. Like, I don't. I guess it's just for the interviews. It's a big, it's a big, big just job interview in general. But it's it's that threat, I guess, of also embarrassing yourself too. Could that be part of it? That could be. I mean, especially like you don't want your draft stock to plummet because you have a bad showing out there, which happens more times than you know people really realize. Um that you can lose some draft position, but I mean, you had kids like, like Braden Fisk from Florida state ran a four, seven, and he's a massive man. He goes out there, runs under four, eight in his 40 and had a really great showing overall as a defensive tackle, which it seems like every NFL team is in need of somebody on the defensive line, which is great for him. Um, but then you have situations 
like um like uh, like like Jordan Travis. You know, he had that really gruesome, you know, season ended injury um mm-hmm. at Florida State and this was the first time he actually really suited up and was competing with everyone else and it was really great to see him come back from this, but that's just going to help. It's just going to help him out from here on out. That's really the biggest concern is just his injury and his recovery at this point. But yeah, I think embarrassment is probably one of the biggest reasons why some of these kids don't want to go out there. I think it's no surprise that Malik neighbors graded the highest out of all the positions <laughs> overall. Who is looking like the number one receiver right now? Is it still Marvin Harrison jr? I think Malik and Marvin are kind of neck and neck at this point about being the first wide receiver off the board, I'm still going to die on my Hill with Roma Dunze being the best wide receiver to come out of this class overall, but it's definitely going to be down to those two being the first off the board. All right. We're going to find out NFL. Oh man, it's getting exciting. I'm not letting NFL offseason take over our UFL time. We're dedicating to the, we're dedicated to the UFL. I'm in contact with the DC defenders people already about getting the three, two, three in there back there actually but in the meantime let's close out the show with some basketball talk and i want to talk a little bit about the los angeles clippers they're having an interesting season this year there's players on there that had no idea were on there completely because of the nfl season completely somehow forgot that james harden was a clipper i don't know how i missed that the clippers have a big three of Kawhi leonard paul george james harden and i think russell westbrook is in there somewhere so everyone has a big three. That's why you didn't realize that everyone I, has a big three. And, and I mean, Russell, I mean, James Harden has been the biggest of any big three for a while. But these new these new uniforms, the Clippers unveiled a new era. They're going to get new uniforms, a new logo. I didn't know Battleship that a ship was what the Clipper was supposed to be. I don't know what I thought the Clipper was before. I, maybe it could have been a paper clip. Maybe it could have been scissors. I don't know. But apparently it's a ship. And the Clippers, along with their new stadium and everything, they put out some new uniforms. We have them right here for you to check out. And, uh, uh, I mean, eh, I don't know what, I don't, I don't know. I I just, I don't get why new sports logos and uniforms have to be so damn boring. Like, there's nothing exciting about these. Like, they're just, it's just standard ass uniforms that are out there and you just keep seeing this major league baseball did it with the uh with the i mean it was almost every team getting some type of new alternate uniform but the washington nationals getting their uniforms changed up their logo potentially changed up to a really boring w i don't know what this new era in uniform and logo making is about scott but professional sports uniforms could they be more garbage? Uh, we, especially with the Clippers, those belong in the toilets. Yes. Like those are gross and it just lacks so much creativity. I mean, you can think of 20 million other names. You could, like, we had this huge, me, you and zoo had this huge discussion when the whole Washington football team and they were announcing what the new team name was going to be and like what they wanted, like what fans wanted to do, but it just lacks so much creativity. And I think it really boils down to what everything boils down to nowadays. And it's money. You look at those jerseys and you got to think of how much of production value it is to, for them to create those and print those things off. It probably costs nothing to get those printed and get those made and manufactured versus something that's going to be a little bit more elaborate with different color schemes and a little bit more, oomph to them Mm -hmm. but it's just and and it's not even just you know professional sports that you're seeing this in hell you're seeing this with with fast food chains i went out and i was driving around today i was looking at all the damn fast food chains whatever happened to the nice little you know sunroom with wendy's or you know you had all like the play places and like the burger kings and you had like the you know the big golden arches for mcdonald's and the pizza hut you know roof was looks like a fucking hut it's it's just to be able to be able to transition. If, if one of those institutions were to get sold off, somebody else can move in. They don't have to worry about renovating the whole damn thing. They can just slap their stuff on there and keep going. Same thing with these jerseys. They're so boring and they leave so much left as far as a want on the table that it's, it, it, it's, I don't know. It, I hate it. I hate everything about it. You, you and Clippers owner Steve Ballmer said it the best about where those uniforms should go. Toilets! 
But I want I look, I want to I want to celebrate the teams. Ooh. What? I have a thought. Uh-huh. I don't, and it's just the way I'm thinking right now. But if you look at those jerseys again, you see how much negative space is on the front of those jerseys. You know what fit really nicely right there? A battleship a sponsor, a sponsor's logo. Oh god, yeah, that's where they're going to go, isn't it? Like a hundred percent, like it's opened up for sponsors because NBA uniforms have started doing that. They've started putting more kind of like soccer, which I just don't like. This isn't NASCAR. This isn't racing. Yep. You keep that, you keep that big space open there on Kawhi's chest and you can just plug and play whatever sponsors logo you want. It doesn't matter. And their new logo looks like a target, but it's a ship and it doesn't really like that's the. I liked the Clippers uniform for as boring as, or not their uniform, their logo for as boring as it was. I knew who they were. That's the other thing. These damn shield logos that all these teams are coming out with. And it's not even just in the NBA. It's across all, all the major sports aside from the NHL, who I feel the NHL out of all four major sport leagues have the most creativity with their logos. They're wild. But I mean, I mean, look at it's, it's all these badges. I mean, especially in the MLB, you have the Mariners and the Rangers and the and the Astros. The Nats had one for a while. The athlete, the A's have them. It's just this circle patch, and that's all it is. There's nothing creative creative about it. It's just such a bland and boring thing. It's all these crests that they want to do. It's kind of like soccer, and I, and you know what, soccer soccer was doing that first. It's about a crest and a shield and all that. That's cool. That's their thing. We don't like not every other sport needs to keep doing that. And it just keeps getting more and more boring, these circular things, these circular logos. We need more good, creative, fun logos. And we need the people who are in charge of these minor league baseball teams to be in charge of branding. That's what we need. That's damn right. Get fanatics out of here. Get who get get wacky Willie Willie Wonderstone, who's doing the you know Savannah Bananas marketing, and get him in there. Definitely not whoever does the Fred Nats. They never call us back, oh. so we can talk shit about them. Fuck them. <laughs> Fuck them. That was such a that was another a, another great opportunity to do something really cool, and they fucking squandered it. Yep. That's, that was such a talk about letting the air out of a balloon and just seeing it just fly around the room. That was such a. I was so excited the week leading up into that unveiling, and when they finally released it, I was so just upset and very annoyed that here we go again they just don't want to do anything fun got the fun police out here well look fuck the fun police fuck the fred nats fuck the clippers we want to celebrate logos that are actually cool that are actually fun that are actually creative there are many there are there are many not a lot but there are many current sports logos professional sports teams that have logos that are fun cool and creative we're going to highlight those right now with a special top five. The top five current logos in professional sports. Five, four, three, two, one. This is the three, two, threes top five. Ah, oh, shit. Here we go again. That's right. The top five current logos in professional sports. That's what we're jumping into today. Scott, it's going to be a good one. I like what we've got. What are you cracking up about over there, Giggle Fest? I don't, <laughs> I don't know if it's the, just the first time that I've noticed that. Did you redo the intro? <laughs> For the top five? Top, for the top five to have the guy from GTA on there? <laughs> oh, yeah, we got him in there. Yeah, we got, <laughs> we got our guy. We got the whole in there. And for those who are wondering what I'm referencing to on the audio medium, you're going to have to go to the visual media on uh, on YouTube at 323 to see what exactly on the intro I was referring to. That's right, the 323 network on YouTube. You're and missing if, out if you're if not. You comment that char- and if you comment that character's name below um, correctly, I will give you one great Scottism for your bit of advice for that day. Look at that. And we do look at the comments. We we get to the comments, and Scott will argue with you in the comments if you rile them up well enough. Oh, it is, Scott. And with visual aid, because this is the 323 Network on YouTube, you got to go there. The top five logos in sports. All right? It's going to be a good one. This is going to be a fun one. And I want to start with our OLIs, because I'm sure we have we had plenty of OLIs here. And 
these were these were Scott's OLIs. I want to I want to I want you to go over these with me. What did you have going here, Scott? Yeah. Uh, so it was like like you said, Reed. It was a very difficult task to comb through all four major sport leagues logos and really pick out what I like the best. And it really only came down to 10. And these are the four that kind of were on the outskirts. You got the Tampa Bay Lightning for hockey. You got the Milwaukee Brewers for baseball, which I really love how they kind of have that that play on. You know, got the M and the B in the mitt. And it also makes a baseball glove, which I think is really cool. Oh, I like that. I'd never realized that before. I like that. You're welcome. Oh my Same God. thing with the Milwaukee Bucks. They have that negative space basketball and the antlers of the buck, which is really, really neat. Um, and then the Jaguars. The Jaguars, I've always felt, have one of the best logos in the NFL. Um, I really like when a team can not only do um, an untraditional kind of mascot, but also with untraditional colors like the teal and the gold and black. I think that's really cool. And the, just the simplicity with the lightning bolt. That's all you need to say. That's, that's easy. The, the lightning bolt is pretty slick, especially with the colors, especially when they switch it out between being white, you know, full white with a blue accent or blue with the white accent. I like that with Tampa Bay. I like yeah. that our that our picks in general are not going to. There's not much crossover whatsoever, because. And I was surprised when you told me that when I sent you over my list, and you're like, "Oh, there's only one that's repeating." I was like, "What do you mean? Which ones did you?" Now I'm interested to see which ones you picked. And now there is one that's slightly repeating that you'll recognize in my OLIs. Or actually, no, there's not. I changed my OLIs. I forgot. I forgot that I went. I narrowed it down to five because I actually had about nine OLIs. <laughs> but I, I once I saw that you had four, I'm like, ah, I'm, I'm maybe overcompensating. So <laughs> these are the ones that didn't quite make it for me. I like the Miami Marlins uh, logo there. I love the colors. I love the Miami Knights that they go for with that team now. You know, the dark and that teal. It's really slick to me. Vegas Golden Knights have been a really fun, cool team added mm -hmm. into the NHL. I like that logo. That's pretty slick, and I love the V. I'm a, we're, you can tell we're both suckers for initiating the, you know, the a letter or some type of wording into whatever your cool logo is. St. Louis Cardinals might just be, you know, a, a nostalgic person. That's me. I like my dad was my dad's team. I was the team I grew up on before the Nationals. I think it's classic. It's cool. It's cute. Look at that Cardinal. Such a sweet eye. But he's a little serious. Mm -hmm. He's ready for work. The New York Red Bulls. I like it. I like the logo. I'm not giving in to corporate greed. I won't put them on my top five. I will not, <laughs> <laughs> I will not dive into that corporate greed there. But it's creative. It's pretty cool. Makes a lot of money. And then the NFL. Shame on you, National Football League. You're the biggest league in American sports. And your logos are so shitty. Like there's not there's you're hard pressed to find a good logo. You can make some arguments, maybe for a couple, but they're damn it's just all boring. And I gotta give it to the Cleveland Browns. I had to throw them on my OLIs because their logo is so impressively boring. It's their, they just leaned into it. Their logo is their <laughs> helmet. And they don't have a logo on their helmet because the logo is the helmet. They're always wearing it. Now, they have that creepy elf that's on the field. And I think there's a dog that might be their logo. But this is still their official logo, just their helmet. So that's all I can give you, NFL. That's the well, only one I can give you. Well, and I'm and I'm glad that you threw in the the Red Bulls in there because I for one I didn't even think about even looking at an MLS team logo because I know most of them like you said are just like the patches and the shield and stuff like that. But um, just thinking about it offhand, I do like the Portland Timbers logo with the axe and it's yeah. a very simplistic kind of design. But um, yeah, the NFL with all their money that they have, you'd think they'd be able to squander some kind of marketing, some better marketing team. And maybe I'm just still hung up on that hentai panel from uh, from Awesome Con a couple years ago. But the St. Louis Cardinals, the C that's gripping the bat, it's got me feeling a type of way right now. I don't know if that's good or bad. I don't. That's kind of. That's a little suggestive. No, I'm I'm feeling some movement. Yeah, that's a little that's a little <laughs> weird. Maybe that's why the Cardinals <laughs> looking like that. Maybe that's why it's so kind of freaked out. It's kind of you, you know what? And in my my very long 33 years of life, this is the first time I've actually even noticed that. And I'm never going to not see it now. So I, thank yeah, you. that's all I can see now. That's all I can tell. Might have just gotten into the top five. I don't know yet.
We'll, t- oh, we'll go. But I'll kick it off because we talked about hockey logos being crazy and kind of creative. And that's where my number five is. My number five is a hockey logo, and that is the San Jose Sharks right there. Whoa. Uh-oh. Whoa. Oh, my gosh. Creativity. <laughs> Do we have fanfare music anywhere? Is it anywhere? There it is. Aha. The San Jose Sharks. I like it. It's just very menacing. It's very extra. Look at that shark just chomping down on a hockey yep. stick. I like, I've like. i noticed, and you'll notice it through the top five, 90s logos were passionately insane. Like They the were wild. So this one is still from the 90s. They haven't changed it since. Credit to San Jose. It kind of looks like a shark that's like a jet. I don't know what's happening there. But uh, don't yeah. Don't you dare take it away. Don't you don't you take that. Don't you take that stick from that thing. No, oh, and this goodness. just goes back to what I was telling you. Like the if you go and look at the NHL logos just in mass, like they're so much better than any of the other logos in any of the other sports franchises oh, or sports leagues. For sure, for sure. Scott, your number five? Uh my number five is my selfish pick this week, and that is the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Yeah, I kind of saw that coming. Look at that. It's just beautiful. And ever since they rebranded, they got the new jerseys with the pu- the old pewter jerseys. And, oh, I will say I I do like this one slightly more, slightly more than the old Buccaneer of the Creamsicle days. But I'd if go- they were able to bring the Creamsicle Buccaneer back and put the new spin on the colors on there, I would love it. If there's an argument for any other NFL logo but the Boring Browns, it's the, it's the Bucks. It's that flag. That's pretty cool. It's a pretty rad one. And I never noticed the football up until like a couple years ago when I was trying to do trivia being on there. <laughs> I like that. That's pretty slick. Uh, number four for me, I'm going to stay in Florida, uh, you know, with your Florida area. But I'm going to go down to Miami and I'm going to basketball. I'm going with the Miami Heat here. I like the flaming basketball. It's really cool. It looks like it's going to come crashing down and blow everything to hell. Give me the Miami Heat. I guess I fell in love with that during the LeBron James era when I kind of became like a a weird bandwagon Heat fan. I don't know. There's something just cool about it. And uh, it makes me think of culture. They're always talking culture. It's got me on a culture streak. Give me the Miami Heat there at number four. What about for you, Scott? Number four? Uh, Number four, uh, talk about culture. We're going to go with the Chicago Blackhawks. Hey. Oh, my gosh. I, like I mean, it. you have one of the founding the founding franchises in the NHL. They have been around since the dawn of time. When you think NHL, this is what I think of. Um, the Chicago Blackhawks are usually at the forefront of my mind. And there's, I just love the 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 representation that you know natives get and indigenous people get, especially when they can do it the right way. Unlike the Cleveland Indians. Oh, my gosh. I saw that one again today because I saw the Cleveland Guardians logo for the first time. Mm-hmm. Which, by the way, the Guardians logo, trash. Mm-hmm. Better than the racism of the uh, the Indians logo, but trash. The Blackhawks logo, that's really beautiful. I love the colors. That's very vib- vibrant and cool. That's a good one to have. Number three. Number three, I'm actually going to the WNBA with this one. And that is the New York Liberty. It's, again, got that same kind of thing with a basketball on fire. And maybe that's something I like. Maybe I like. I loved I loved uh, J. Cole's <laughs> album with the lit up uh, basketball court. Maybe I like basketballs on fire. Maybe I'm a pyro. But this is a pretty cool logo that I saw for the first time today with the Statue of Liberty added in there holding up the basketball. I thought it was really cool and a really uh, a unique color for a logo. I think it's really unique. I like it. That's why I roll with them. That's good for creativity. Number three, Scott? Um, well, now I just feel bad about myself because <laughs> I've got two I've got two teams from the same league on my list, and WNBA is not on my list at all, so <laughs> poop, poo-poo on me. Uh, number three, we're going to go with the Boston Celtics. Hey. I mean, another one of those storied franchises. I mean, it just, the, the logo speaks for itself the brand recognition that brings the creativity that it has. It's just, it, it's just such a great logo. It's classic. You have to roll with that. That's a classic logo. Makes me feel, think a little bit of a tinge of racism, but that's just Boston. Hey, that's just, that's just my logo. I I, I I say it's okay. Okay. All right. Well, you got it. It is March. (laughs) It is March now. I'm sorry. I apologize. 
Number two. Number two for me, it's another logo from the NHL. It's one that I've, I've seen before, but I never really looked at it as deep as I did today. I love this logo. I think the colors are cool as fuck. I think the design of it is cool as fuck, and that is the Minnesota Wild. Yep. I love that with the forest in the background, the bear as its logo, the shooting stars, the eye, the sunset. Like, it's such a cool logo. Like, that is absolutely badass. I couldn't tell you anything about the Minnesota Wild. I learned of a lot of NHL teams today actually going through this. I didn't know there was an Arizona Coyotes. I had no idea Arizona had a hockey team. Holy shit. I learned so much hockey today. That is your host of a sports network, learning hockey to do top five logos on the show. (laughs) But the Minnesota Wild, really cool. Even the lake is the mouth. Oh, it's so just, it's so detailed and elegant. I love this. I love this one. No, me and you are are definitely cucks to imagery and dual purpose logos like this. Cucks to imagery. (laughs) (laughs) Cucks to imagery is a description I didn't expect to hear about ourselves. That's the name of my next album. <laughs> <laughs> number two for you, Scott. Uh, number two is the number one logo in all of Major League Baseball, and that is the Baltimore Orioles. Uh... But you can't compete with it. You just can't. No, you, you just can't. can't compete with it. It has a nice little retro feel. I'm glad they went with that route rather than the old, you know, very hyper realistic Oreo logo that they were running. But when you look at the MLB as a whole with their logos, um, there's a huge drop off. You got them. You got the Cardinals. I do love the White Sox logo. I will say that there's something very classic and retro and like really elicits an emotional response by looking at that still. But after them, it's it's really just bunch of crap i I, i'm a hundred percent with you to the to the degree that it's my number one wow the baltimore orioles are my number one uh logo i've always been just attracted to that logo i think it's such a cool one you said everything that needed to be said only thing i'll add look how look how happy he is look how happy he's just so happy to be there he's just happy for baseball he's cute like this is a le- this is a lesson, sports teams. This is a lesson to all of you pros. Your logo can be cute. Your mascot can be cute. Be look th- be like the Oriole. Nothing has to be all god fearing creatures that you have in the NFL and whatever. Go cute or insane like the NHL. That's all I would throw. Number one for you, Scott. Uh, the number one logo in all of sports is the Chicago Bulls. Hey. I mean, it's it's perfect. It's it's perfect. You never have to change it. It is the the greatest logo that I think I've ever seen across all brands. They did a really great job with it. And I swear to God, if they ever change it, I'm going to riot. <laughs> it just brings me back. You just look at that logo. And like I said, uh, I think a lot of this, it's more built on emotional ties like you said with the with the with the cardinals with your dad with me with the chicago bulls you know growing up in the mid 90s and late 90s you know af- during recess or after school you're going out and you're playing basketball with your friends and at that point in time i was the only other i was the only scott that i ever knew and then you had scotty pippen playing for the bulls so here i am pretend that i'm you know six seven scotty pippen out there playing basketball and it's it just elicits such an emotional response in in my soul that it's just such a perfect logo. That's the beauty of logos. That's why these teams need to take it more seriously. These things stick with people. They stick with kids. People are going to remember this one. They're going to remember the ones that we brought up. They're not going to think about the Clippers battleship marching at you when they're, you know, I mean, even though they're, they're still not going to be winning championships even with all this new stuff. But just get creative. Get cool. That's all the Clippers could have done. The Clippers could have been like a pair of scissors with some eyes in the holes like it would have been just cool as shit it could have had clippy from microsoft be their logo buy him off now that i I'm think sure he's he officially dead. He, he could use the work I in this seen economy in this economy <laughs> give clippy some help oh those are the top five logos in current professional sports and this has been the 323 i've uh, got to thank scott elliott host of 323 college shame day go to the 323 network on YouTube to check him out and some more content 
that we're going to put out for our ahead of our appearance at Awesome Con, which is, of course, Friday, March 8th, 9 p.m., room 207A at the Walter E. Washington Convention Center. It's going to be a really fun time playing some naughty family feud and geeky trivia. We're going to be there all weekend. You'll be able to see us, hang out with us, probably do a little after party. I don't know where we're going to go yet, but we're going to have a little after party that you'll hear about there. We'll put it out on the social medias, which you can find with me, your host, Reed Murphy, at 323Reed. See us on social media. Find out what we're going to be doing. Follow us during the journey. Come say hi to us while we're shopping. Maybe buy us something. We'll buy you something. We'll buy you something cheap. You can buy us something expensive, but we'll buy you something cheap. Don't worry about that. It's going to be a great time. We hope to see everybody there. Scott, thank you for being here. In the meantime, folks. Yes, Scott? I was just stretching. Oh, I lo- that was a good stretch. <laughs> that was a good nipply stretch. <laughs> roll with it. it's, for the, it's for the YouTube fans. <laughs> In the meantime, folks, stay safe. We'll talk to you later. <laughs>